welcome back to my channel. And if you are visiting this channel for the first time, you are also highly welcome. In this lecture, we'll be looking at this cap. This cap is a soft layered structure that is seen to cover the cranial vault. Right on with me as I unfold the layers of this cap, the structural components of the different layers of this cap, and also some clinical and applied anatomy. This cap, as we've said, is a soft layered structure that is seen to envelop the cranial vault. This is where we have the configuration here, highlighted in dotted red. This region is where we have the cranial vault, and it is a region of the cranium that provides accommodation site for the brain tissue. So this alignment is what creates the extension of the scalp from this anterior part running posteriorly behind. So you have the extension of this cap anteriorly from the supraorbital margin. This is where we have the supraorbital margin here, harrowed in purple. The supraorbital margin is a protuberance or a swelling that is seen above the high region. This is where we have the high region. And above it, we have the supraorbital margin here that is highlighted here in purple. And this is where we have the anterior extension of this cap. And you see it going posteriorly where it is finally inserted on the superior nuchal line. This is where we have the superior on the car line here, yeah, harrowed in green. It is seen at the base of the occipital bone. If you've not checked up my lecture on the neurocranium, please kindly go and do so. In that lecture, we describe the occipital bone as part of the neurocranial bones. And if you look at the way the occipital bone is configured, it extends behind. And of course, it also forms part of the base of the neurocranium. Specifically, it is in the base of the hospital bone that we have the nuchal lines. The nuchal lines are lines that are created around this region. Using this image up here as illustration, this is where we have the base of the hospital bone. And if you look at it, you see that at this anterior part, we have the foramen magnum. If you go more behind, of course, still at the base of the occipital bone, you see the nuchal line. If you look at this image here, this is where we have the external occipital protuberance. This protuberance is like a swelling or elevation of bone that is seen at the median region of the base of the hospital bone. So this is where we have the external hospital protuberance here that is harrowed here in black. If you go more lateral ward from the external hospital protuberance, you see the superior nuchal line. So this is a deep line that is seen to run lateral from the external occipital protuberance. And this is what is harrowed here in yellow. So you have one on this side. So you also have another one on the other side running from the external occipital protuberance. So this is where we have the superior nuchal line. And of course, from the external hospital protuberance, going down along the midline, you have the median nuchal line. And this is what is harrowed here in blue. If you then go more inferior to the superior nuchal line, you have the inferior nuchal line. And this is what is harrowed here in red. So you can see that these nuchal lines are created or seen at the base of the hospital bone. We also have the IS nuchal line here, just for us to know. And this is what is highlighted here in hash. This IS nuchal line is not really prominent. It is not as deep as the superior and the inferior nuchal line, just for us to know. But the superior nuchal line is a specific region where we have the posterior extension of this cap. So if you go deep down here, yeah, the superior nuchal line will be located somewhere and around this region where it is arrowed here in green. So you have anteriorly from the supraorbital margin extending and going posteriorly to be inserted on the superior nuchal line. We've tried to establish the different nuchal lines that are seen at the base of the hospital bone. So this is the configuration of the base of the hospital bone. And if you go more above, you then have the posterior region of the hospital bone. So the hospital bone will we run from behind and also from the base of the skull. So it is around the region where it forms the base of the skull that we have these expressions of the nuchal line. So specifically, it is the superior nuchal line that creates a posterior attachment for the scalp. And of course, this cap will extend laterally to reach the ear and also the zygomatic hatch. So if you look at it, after extending anteriorly from the supraorbital margin, I'm going posteriorly and being started on the superior nuclear line. On the lateral side, you see it extends to where we have the ear and also where we have the zygomatic hatch. And this is what is harrowed here in red. So these are the extensions of the scalp 
from anterior to posterior, then to lateral. What are the layers of the scalp? Remember when we started this lecture, we said that the scalp is a layered structure, which means that it will be seen to have layers. The scalp is basically made up of five layers, and the layers can be established based on the acronym SCAP. So it is very easy for us to list the different layers of the scalp through the spelling of the scalp. So we'll be taking the layers one after the other, hairs will be the first layer, and this layer would mean the skin, and this is where we have the skin here, yeah, harrowed in red. The skin is the most outer layer of the scalp, and this is understandable because we know that in the region where we have the scalp, we also have the skin. And of course, the skin will not be seen in any other region except from the most outer layer of the scalp. So it forms the most outer layer of the scalp. And this is what is seen in this image. So deep to the skin, the next layer we have is the C layer. And this layer will be the connective tissue layer. This connective tissue is a dense type of connective tissue. So deep to the skin, we have the second layer that is also already in red as the dense connective tissue layer. Then the next layer is the hair layer and this A will mean the aponeurosis. So this is the layer of the aponeurosis that's also already in red, which is deep to the connective tissue layer. Then the next layer will be the hair layer, which is the loose areolar tissue layer. Of course, this will be deep to the layer of aponeurosis. So this is what we see here and it's harrowed here in black. And the last layer, which is the P layer, will be the pericranium. This is the pericranium here that is harrowed here in purple. The pericranium is the layer that is seen immediately after the bone. So it means that deep to the pericranium will be having the bone here that is harrowed in yellow. So after the bone, we know that we then have the cranial cavity where the brain tissue is contained. So the scalp is made up of five layers and those five layers can easily be established based on the acronym scalp. So for the skin, the connective tissue layer and also the layer of aponeurosis are seen as a fused unit, which means that they are tightly collected together. So they tend to act as a single unit. But it's good for us to know that the first three layers are tightly packed, and that is why they tend to act as a single unit. And this is very important during the process of surgery when we need to cut open the scalp. This loose areolar tissue layer will be the point of reflection where the scalp can be cut open because it is loose when compared to the first three layers that are tightly packed or collected together. So when an incision is made, this layer will be a point where reflection can be made during the process of surgery. We'll also be dwelling more on this as we go through with this lecture. So we'll be taking each of the layers one after the other to see the structural configuration. So first talking about the skin, the skin we say that it is the most outer layer and that is what we see on the outside. So the skin is the thick layer that has numerous sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are all secreting glands that helps to lubricate the scalp. And you see that the sebaceous glands are scattered within the skin layer of the scalp. You look at this configuration up here, the region that is highlighted here in blue, is where we have the skin. And within the skin, you see that you have sebaceous gland highlighted here in white and harrowed in red. These sebaceous glands are seen to be scattered. Even though they are numerous, they are seen to be scattered within the skin layer of the scalp. And this is what is projected in this image. And what they do basically is to secrete oily substances that are used to lubricate the scalp because the scalp also needs to be lubricated so that whatever that is growing on it, we also have the free will to run or move against friction. So we have this kind of presentation within the skin, which is the first layer of the scalp. And because they are numerous, this is a potential site where we have the sebaceous cyst. The sebaceous cyst is like a swollen that is seen below the skin. If you look at this image down here, the region here that is also harrowed here in red, there is a swelling on this scalp region. And this is as a result of the sebaceous cyst that is formed within the sebaceous gland. And also within the skin, which is the first layer of the scalp, we also have numerous air follicles. These are the air follicles here that is harrowed here in yellow. The air follicles are like hair pores. They're like the root of the hair. This is where the hair strands grow from. 
the difference between this air follicles and sebaceous gland is that even though the two are numerous within the skin layer of the scalp, the sebaceous gland is scattered. While the air follicles, you see that they are collected together. And because they are collected together, it means that the strands of hair that will be gray from each air follicles will also be collected together. And this is why we have this kind of presentation of this image on this other side. You see that the air strands are usually densely packed, you know, clumping together. They they are also numerous, but they are densely packed together. So you see them, they are closely packed together so that whatever that is going to be growing out of the air follicles will also be densely or closely packed together. And that is what is seen in the presentation of our hair. And what these hair strands do is that they help in the conservation of it. They also help to enhance the appearance of human. The skin layer of the scalp is also seen to have numerous sensory receptors. We know that the skin is one of the sense organs that we have in the body. So it is expected that sensory receptors will also be numerous in this area. And this is where the sensory impulses are taken up into the sensory cortex where interpretation will occur. So they also contain numerous sensory receptors. So you can see that within the skin layer of the scalp, we have a number of structures that are located within it in quantum. So we have the sebaceous gland, we have the hair follicles, and we also have the sensory receptors. So going to the next layer, which is the connective tissue layer. So this is where we have the connective tissue layer. And this is the second layer after the skin. The skin is highlighted here in blue and is located on the external part. Why deep to the skin layer of the scalp we have the connective tissue layer? So using this image up here, this is where we have the connective tissue layer also arid and bright. So this is the second layer that is deep to the skin. So this connective tissue is a dense type of connective tissue and the structures that are basically seen within this region are fat, blood vessels and also nerve. So if you look at it, you see fibers of connective tissue that is highlighted here in blue that are densely packed and you see blood vessels that are highlighted here in red while nerve vessels here are highlighted in black. And also we have a collection of fats within this region, which means that this region is highly vascularized and also innervated because of the presentation of vessels and also nerves that are located or seen within this layer. So it's good for us to know that even though this layer can is richly vascularized, the blood vessels are tightly held in place by the fibers of the connective tissue. Remember we said that this connective tissue layer is made up of dense connective tissue, which means that they are densely packed. So you see that the blood vessels, let's say this is what is presented here in red, this tube that is highlighted here in red represents the blood vessel. And if you look at the strands of the connective tissue fibers, you see that they are tightly connected to the blood vessels. And because of this connection, when there is a cord that extends down to the second layer of the scalp, which is the connective tissue layer part, the process of vasospasm or vasoconstriction will not be able to occur because the fibers of the connective tissue will be holding the blood vessels in place, thereby preventing constriction of the vessels to prevent loss of blood. So this site, during laceration, the blood vessels are are unable to constrict. So it's a site of profuse bleeding during laceration. So it's good for us to be able to highlight this so that when injury occur, we'll be able to explain the reason behind profuse bleeding because the process of vasoconstriction will not be able to occur. And this is basically directed towards the adherence of these blood vessels to the connective tissue. We're going to the third layer, which is the layer of aponeurosis. This layer can also be referred to the epicranial aponeurosis or the gallia aponeurotica. It's good for us to be able to establish these two names because these names may be used in place of this layer, maybe during our examination. So it can also be referred to as the epicranial aponeurosis, which means that the aponeurosis that is seen above the cranium, and this is a dense fibrous tissue layer that has a presentation of a tendon-like sheet. If you look at this image down here, this is where we have the aponeurosis that is harrowed here in red. If you look at this region, you see that it presents a tendon-like sheet appearance. So it is actually a tendon that extends from the bellies 
consists of occipital frontalis muscle. So this is a muscle that seems to extend from the frontal region down to the occipital region. But of course, it has two bellies, and in between the bellies is where we have the aponeurosis. It's one of the interesting muscles of the head and neck region. So if you look at this image down here, this is where we have the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. Then if you go more posteriorly, this is where we have the occipital bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. This muscle has four bellies. So it has two at the front and it has two behind. So using this image up here, this is where we have the cranial vault. And this is specifically the third layer of the scalp. And this is where we have the aponeurosis. So if you look at this configuration at the front, we have two bellies, which is the frontal belly. You have one on the right that is highlighted here in red. Then you have another one on the left that is also highlighted here in red. So this is the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle. We say that they are made up of four bellies. We have two at the front and also two behind. So at the posterior part, we have the hospital belly, and this is the right part of the occipital belly, and we also have the left part of the occipital belly. So these are the occipital bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. So in between these bellies is where we have the aponeurosis created. So the aponeurosis is like connecting the two bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. So you see it's extending from the frontal part down to the occipital part, and this is what is harrowed here in red. So if you look at this strand that is highlighted here in blue, you see that they tend to run from the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle down to the hospital bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle. And this aponeurosis is what is seen at the third layer of the scalp. And this is what they call the aponeurotic layer of the scalp. It's actually an aponeurosis of a muscle. So going deep further on the frontal and the hospital belly, it's good for us to also highlight this fact. For the frontal belly, you see that at the front, using this image down here, this is where we say we have the frontal belly at the front. This frontal belly, if you look at it, it does not have a bony connection. So it is not connected to bone. If you look at this region here that is harrowed in yellow at the upper part of the eye, we also have a number of muscles, you know, forming this eyebrow region. So the strands of this muscle are seen to merge with the strands of the frontalis muscle. So this frontalis muscle is not seen to have a bony attachment at the arterial part. And that is why it is able to express wrinkling. So you can wrinkle the anterior part of the head where we have the frontalis muscle because of these presentations. It doesn't present any form of tightness because it is not connected to bone. Using this image up here for further illustration, remember the region here that is highlighted in red is the region where we have the frontal bellies. If you look at the frontal belly, you see that they are closely packed. It's not like the hospital belly that we have space in between. We'll also be justifying the reason why these space are so created. So if you look at the anterior bellies, you see that they are connected to muscles that are seen to form the high bro region. Let's say this is where we have the high. And above the high, we have the region here that is highlighted in black. That is the eyebrow region above the eye. So we have a number of muscles that also form the structural component of this eyebrow region. We have three muscles basically. If you look at her, the median side, where we have the glabella. The glabella is a depression that is created between the two eyebrow regions. So we have the glabella, like an indentation that is created at the median side of the eyebrow. And this glabella is filled up with a muscle that is referred to as the procerus muscle. The fibers of this procerus muscle also seem to merge with fibers of the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. So this is what is highlighted here in dotted blue. So you have it also merging with fibers of the procerus around the midline region. If you go more medially, still around the region of the high bro, you also see fibers of this corrugator supercilium muscle. You also have fibers of this muscle also merging with the fibers of the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle. And this is around the medial side. So if you go more laterally, the next muscle that you see that the fibers will also be merging with the fibers of the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle is the ubicularis oculis. So you have these three muscles around the highbrow region from median side where we have the procerus muscle, then medially to that we have the corrugator spatulis muscle, then more laterally we have the orbicularis oculi. So these three muscles are the muscles that have their fibers merging with the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle. You see that the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle is not seen to have bony connection. And this is why the frontal belly is loose and 
create a form of wrinkling effect at that region because there is a loose connection around that region because it is not connected to bone. Then going to the occipital belly. So using this image down here, this is where we have the occipital belly. And this occipital belly is inserted on the lateral region of the superior nuchal line. So it's good for us to be able to establish the specific region of the superior nuchal line that the occipital belly of the occipital frontalis muscle is located. Remember we described the superior nuchal line in our previous slide. Remember we talked about the external occipital protuberance that is high rhodian grain in our previous slide. We said that this is like a thick mass of bone that is seen around the base of the hospital bone. This is the configuration of the base of the hospital bone. This is where we have the foramen magnum is the largest foramen of the cranium. So this is the base of the hospital bone, where we have also extension above, which is seen at the posterior part of the skull. So this is the base, and we have a protuberance here that is referred to as the external hospital protuberance. We say that on the lateral side of the external hospital protuberance is where we have the superior nuchal line. And this is what is harrowed here in black. So it is on the lateral side of the superior nuchal line that we have the placement of the occipital bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle. So this is where we have the placement of the occipital belly on this right side. We also have the superior nuchal line also extending from the external occipital protuberance here on the lateral side. So on the lateral side of the superior nuchal line, yes, also where we have the placement of the left occipital belly of the occipital frontalis muscle. So you can see that the occipital bellies are spacely placed. So we have space in between them because of the position of their placement, because they are located on the lateral side of the superior nuchal line. This is the superior nuchal line here extending from the external occipital protuberance. This is the medial region, and this is where we have the lateral region. You can see that it is on the lateral region of the superior nuchal line that we have the occipital bellies located. And as we have have the configuration on this right side so also we have on the left side so they are specifically located on the lateral side of the superior nuchal line and that is why we have space created between the occipital bellies. Remember when we described the frontal belly using this image up here, we say that the frontal bellies are closely packed. There is no space between the frontal bellies of the occipital frontalis muscle because of the way they are located or placed around that region. But if you go to the posterior belly using this image up here, you see that the posterior bellies, which are the occipital bellies, so you see that there is a space created between the two hospital bellies. And this is what is seen in this image. So you can see that the hospital belly is connected to bone why the frontal belly is not connected to bone? In case we're asked during examination, we should be able to explain or justify this. If you look at this configuration, you see that it's connected to the superior nuchal line, which of course is a specific region of the base of the hospital bone. The hospital bellies are connected to bone. Why the frontal bellies are not connected to bone? They are connected to fibers of muscles that are seen to form the high bro. We said that the aponeurosis of these two bellies is what is seen to form the third layer of the scalp, which is the layer of aponeurosis. And that is what we'll be driving for that home. So going to the layer of aponeurosis, in the anterior part, you see it's extending from the posterior end of the frontal bellies. So if you look at this image down here, this is where we have the frontal belly, this is where we have the hospital belly. But the aponeurosis of the frontal and the hospital bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle is what is seen to form the third layer of the scalp. So you see that the aponeurosis is extending from this region that is also already in blue, which is the posterior part of the frontal belly. And you see it being directed posterior. So if you use this image up here, this is where we have the origin of the aponeurosis beginning, originating from the posterior end of the frontal belly. And you see it, of course, it runs posteriorly. So let's look at the posterior end and see where it will be inserted upon. So as it runs posteriorly, the posterior end, you see it, it's going to be seen to part between the two occipital bellies. Remember we described earlier that the occipital bellies are spacely packed. It is not tightly packed as what is seen in the frontal belly. And this is what is harrowed here in black. So you see the aponeurosis extending and also driving in between the two occipital bellies. 
So if you try to use this image down here, remember we said this is the external hospital protuberance that is high radiant grain, and laterally we have the superior nuclear line. If you look at the placement of the hospital bellies here, you see one on this side and you see the, another one on the other side. They are located on the lateral side of superior nuclear line. They are leaving this midline space between it. So you now see the aponeurosis is being directed in between the two hospital bellies. So you see fibers from the aponeurosis extending posteriorly onto the external hospital protuberance here that is already ingrained. You also see some of them extending to the medial side of the superior nuclear line. Remember this is the superior nuclear line. This is the medial side and this is the lateral side that has already been occupied by the hospital belly of the frontalis muscle. So for the medial side, you are the insertion of the aponeurosis on this side. Also on the other side, you have the insertion of the aponeurosis also on the medial side of the superior nuclear line. You see that the superior nuclear line presents a specific regions, accommodation site or insertion site for different structures. On the lateral side, it creates insertion site for the occipital bellies, while on the medial side of superior nuclear line, we have the insertion of the aponeurosis. And this is an understandable. So if you look at this image by the side, you see that we have the aponeurosis extending between the two hospital bellies. This is one of the hospital belly. We have another one on the other side, which is not shown in this image because this is a lateral view. So if you look at the aponeurosis extending from posterior end of the frontal belly running, you see it, it is finally patenting between the two hospital bellies before it is finally inserted on the external hospital protuberance and also on the medial side of the superior nuclear line. And this is very easy for us to understand using this image and illustration. Then finally, Going through this configuration, remember we already described the region highlighted here in blue in our previous slide when we tried to describe the first layer of the scalp, which is the skin. This is the region here that is highlighted in blue. This is harrowed at this point. We already described the structural component of the skin layer of the scalp. Deep to the skin, we have the connective tissue layer that is made up of dense connective tissue. We say within this layer, we have fats, we have blood vessels, and we also have nerves. And this is what is establishing this image. Deep to the connective tissue layer, we have the layer of aponeurosis. And this is what is harrowed here. If you look at this layer of aponeurosis with the connective tissue layer and also the skin, they are tightly Heart. And that is why they tend to heart as a single unit. We already described that during the process of surgery, when the scalp is needed to be caught or tear apart, this area are taken as a single unit because the region that is located deep to heat is the loose connective tissue which is not closely packed with these first three layers. Going to the fourth layer, which is the layer of loose areolar tissue. This is the layer that is seen to provide an easy or flexible plane of separation between the upper three layers and also the pericranium. So this is the layer of the pareolar tissue. And of course, most external layer is the skin. This is followed with the connective tissue layer. Then we have the layer of aponeurosis. We already described in a previous slide that these first three layers are tightly packed. So they are seen as a single unit. And inferior to it is where we have the loose areolar tissue. Provide an easy, flexible plane of separation because it is loosely packed with the first three layers that are tightly packed. So this layer can easily be reflected so specifically, what is seen within this loose areolar tissue? In this layer, we have numerous blood vessels, but specifically what is seen within this region are valveless emissary veins presented in blue. And you see that this is a prominent structure within the loose areolar tissue. And what these emissary veins do is that they help to connect the veins of the scalp. Remember that in the other layers of the scalp, we also have vessels. And so it helps to connect the veins of the scalp to the intracranial veins. So this is like a connection point between veins that are located outside the cranium and also veins that are located within the cranium. So you see it connecting to the diploid veins and also the intracranial venous sinuses. So what you see below the loose areolar tissue we have the pericranium that is highlighted here in yellow. But this region has been staged or projected at a danger site. It is a danger area of the scalp because if you look at it, it's going to be creating a pathway for the spread of infection. 
from the extracranial region down to the intracranial region because of the link of the emissary veins that are created between the extracranial veins and also the intracranial veins. So it's going to be creating like a potential site or pathway through which infection can spread from the scalp down to the cranial cavity. So this is tagged as a danger zone. So going to the last layer, which is the pericranium. This is the layer that is seen to be attached to the cranium. And that is why it is so referred to as a pericranium. So after this call, the next layer you see after it is the pericranium. This is also referred to as a periosteum, which is a layer that is attached or closely related to the skull which is the ostium, which is the bony configuration. It is a fine membrane which covers the outer region of the skull. So let's say this is where we have the skull down here. Then overlining it is where we have the pericranium for the periosteum. And this is what is highlighted here in yellow. You see it overlining the skull. This is the deepest layer and it is seen to be aligning with the surface of the skull. The next layer after it on the superficial side is the loose areolar tissue. After the loose areolar tissue, we then have the upper three layers that are closely packed. And this includes the layer of aponeurosis, the connective tissue layer, and also the skin. So this is where we have the pericranium here that is arrowed in blue, which is the deepest layer of the scalp. This layer is seen to be continuous with the endosteum. The endosteum is a membrane that is seen to line the interior of the bone. If you look at the configuration of the skull, you see that they are made up of patches of bones that are joined as sutures. So we have sutures. This is one suture here, arrowed in black. This is another suture here, also arrowed in black. Because the pericranium are seen to be lining the surface of the skull, at the point where we have the sutures, you see that they form a connection point with the membrane that is lining the interior of the skull. So at this sutural point, you see that they become continuous with the endosteum. So talking about the clinical and applied anatomy, scalping is a process of cutting or tearing apart the scalp or during the process of surgery, maybe during craniotomy or other form of surgery. And of course, we've described in our previous slide that the first three layers of the scalp are tightly packed. So the loose areola layer is the region that provides an easy plane of separation during the process of surgery. So when the scalp is needed to be opened up, the upper three layers will be fused. So the loose areola tissue layer would be the layer that would create a line of reflection and this we have tried to highlight during the course of this lecture also we have a danger zone describe the loose areola tissue layer as danger zone this is the fourth layer of the scalp and what is specifically contained within this region that makes it a danger zone is the presence of hemistry vein then also when we have a blow in the head the impact around that region can allow blood to be pushed into the high region, thereby leading to a black high. So if you look at this configuration here, this is where we have the frontal belly of the hospital frontalis. Must remember, we also described this already because of this lecture. And remember, we also stated that the frontal belly is different from the hospital belly because in the frontal belly, it does not have a bony connection. What is connected to are fibers of the muscles that seem to form the eyebrow, while the hospital belly is seen to be connected to the superior nuchal line, which of course is a bony contact. So if you look at the frontal belly, because it doesn't have a connection with bone, at this hand, it will be loose or free. So any eat or punch on the head, blood that is collected within this space will be pushed down and will be collected in the high region. This will lead to a black high kind of projection. I remember that in our previous slide, when we tried to describe the different layers of the scalp, we said that the first three layers are fused together, which means that they are tightly packed. And the next layer after these first three layers is the loose areolar layer. This loose areolar layer is loosely packed, is loosely connected to the first three layers, which are tightly packed, which means that during accident or during impact, blood can be drained through the loose areolar tissue layer. And this will be directed below the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle at the front here, which will further run and be collected into the high region. Because we said that the frontal bellies of the hospital frontalis muscle does not have a bony connection. It is not tight at the front here. It is loosely connected to the fibers of muscles that are seen to form the high bro region. And because of this looseness around this spot, it allows for blood drainage down and be collected into the high region. And this is what will lead to the formation of the black high. So it's good for us to be able to justify why some of these events occur.
with our basic anatomy. So we can check our understanding of this lecture through the following question. And the first one is to highlight the layers of the scalp. This should come easy because we said that the acronym scalp is also used to establish the different layers of the scalp. And the second question is what is Galia aponeurotica? This also should come easy. The third question is justify why deep cuts in the scalp can bleed profusely. This also should come easy. So thanks for watching this video. Let's meet again.